Well, this is it. The marble container that held all the marbles representing the Sundays that I would be a lead pastor in, in the Lord's Church uh, that used to hold 2,000 marbles is down to the last one. When I take out this last marble, that's it. It's all over. Kind of surreal for me to think about it because, you know, this is, you know, for 40 years or more than 40 years, this is all I've known. In fact, Really all my life this is all I've known because my dad was a lead pastor too. So I kind of been around it my entire life. And so it seems kind of surreal. And you know, for the last 15 years, I've been pouring my heart out for you in this church. And so for me to voluntarily step back at this point, it's hard to do. I got to tell you, it's hard to do. It goes against everything I am and everything I believe. But, but deep in my heart of hearts and deep in my soul, my spirit, I know for certain that this is exactly what the Lord wants for me and exactly what the Lord wants for the bridge, and so it feels good. But even though it feels good, that doesn't, that doesn't help in saying goodbye. I mean, how, how, do you, how do you sign off after an unbelievable ride together? I thought about this a lot, and I thought, well, you know, I could use the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who said, there are no goodbyes for us. Wherever you are, you will always be in my heart. That, that'll, that's true. I could, I could use that this morning. Or, or I could use what Nicholas Sparks wrote in one of his books, a mes uh, Message in a Bottle, I believe it's called. He wrote this, his key, key figure wrote this. This is not goodbye, my darling. This is a thank you. I thought, that's true, too. That's a good way to sign up. That's exactly true. I could say that this morning. But that didn't sound right either. And so I, I went back to the old faithful. I went back to Dr. Zeus. <laughs> and, and, of course, when all else fails, go to Dr. Zeus. And he said, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Now, that's true, too. Isn't that true? <laughs> and... and and I thought all three of those are true, and, and I could use those this morning, but you know something? Not one of them felt right. They, they, just, they just didn't felt right. So I instead went to Charles Dickens. He wrote my favorite Christ, Christmas fiction story, you know, A Christmas Carol. I went to him. Here's what he said about saying goodbye. He said, the pain of parting is nothing to the joy of meeting again. And that's my parting to you because even though I am leaving the office of your lead pastor, I'm not leaving you and I'm not leaving the bridge. So the, the pain of saying goodbye is nothing compared to meeting you again. And so that's what makes me happy and joyful this morning. However, in spite of that, still doesn't make it easy. I still got to find a way to somehow say farewell as lead pastor, and that's a hard thing to do. So how do you do that? To be honest with you, I'm not sure I know how to do that, but here goes. I'm going to begin by saying to you, thank you. I'm going to use Nicholas Sparks there and say thank you to you. Thank you for the past 15 years. Thanks for letting me be your pastor all of these years. Thanks for all of the prayers and the love and the care and the words of encouragement. Thank you for creating here such a wonderful, loving, warm, healthy, spiritual place for my three daughters to grow up in, meet their husbands, and now have my grandchildren, at least three of my four grandchildren here in this church. Th thank you so much for that. You know, two of my daughters got married here. All three of my four grandchildren got dedicated here. This is a very special place. Thank you to all of those of you who gave so sacrificially to build that kids' wing that's going to touch the lives of thousands and thousands of kids in the years to come, including four of my own grandchildren. Thank you for that. Thank you for buying into the vision and the mission of the Bridge Church in knowing that church isn't about us, but rather we are here to build irresistible bridges between Jesus Christ and the onchers, the teachers, those who are far from Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for doing that and sharing together and buying into all of those things. You know, to say... And I should also say thank you for letting me be a Leaf fan. Maybe, maybe I should actually say thank you for tolerating me as a Leaf fan. <laughs> and thanks for letting me stick around for a few more years. I, I so deeply appreciate it. And, you know, to, to say that Judy and I, uh, you know, love you and appreciate you for who you are and for all you have done for us is a gross understatement. 
But, but it's out of that love and that care and that compassion for us that, that I bring to you, um, share with you uh, my last words, both last week and this week. If you were here last week, you will remember that, that the Lord kind of laid upon my heart that the last two things that I should talk to you about is really the one thing, the only thing that matters. Of all the things I, could, I have preached on, all the things I could preach on, the number one thing that I should share is getting right with Jesus and staying right with Jesus. Getting right and staying right. Everything else that I might talk about or Scott will talk about will fall under one of these two categories. And last week I started by talking to you about the first half of this, about getting right, by asking you what I said was the most important question that I could ask you. And that question is, are you sure? Are you sure about your relationship with Jesus? Are you sure about uh, going to heaven when you die? And I was literally overwhelmed by the response of those who chose last Sunday to get right, and then those, all of those who rose their hands to, to say, uh, raised their hands to say, I am sure that I'm right with Jesus and on my way to heaven. That's amazing. That's the most important thing. Now this morning, I want to talk about the second half of this, and that's the part about staying right with Jesus. That's so important because, you know, starting right is important. It's really important to start right. But it's even more important to finish right. And so I want to talk to you about finishing right and, and to, to share my thoughts with you. I, I'm, I'm using a passage of Scripture that Paul the Apostle, if you're new to the bridge today, Paul was, he's a historical figure, recognized both by secular historians and Christian historians and he was a leader of the, the Christian church in the first century. And he started many churches. And he wrote about half of the New Testament. And he wrote a letter to one of the churches he started. It was the church in Philippi. And, and he shared with them a very important words about what he was challenging them to do and what he was going to do in the future. And it's a very important and a very appropriate passage to share with you. Because Paul wrote this letter to the church in Philippi near the end of his ministry. And so he was looking to them. He was trying to tell them how to finish right, how to stay right with Jesus Christ. And here's what he challenged them. He said, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already uh, reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it. I'm not perfect yet, he says, but I focus on this one thing, Forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. I'm sure you caught it. I made it in yellow. It says twice in three verses. He said, I press on. That was his encouragement to them. And this is my words to you in, in closing, that you would press on in Jesus Christ. Press on for him with all that you've got. In fact, that word press in the original language, it, it, carries the, it carries the thought of extreme exertion. It, it is a suggestion of leaning forward, of pressing forward. It, it, it's the word picture of a runner in a race. You, you know that racers don't run you know, straight with their back straight. They run a little over, and as they get closer to the finish line, they're leaning even further. They want to be the first across the finish line. And, and that's what Paul is telling us to do. And that's what I'm challenging you to do, is to press on in your faith with Jesus Christ. I don't know if you saw it, but there's a little clip on YouTube uh, about a race that was run, and Texas A&M's uh, athlete, his, his name is Tucker. And, and Tucker won the SEC championship for the 400-meter uh, hurdles. And he won that race by pressing on. Not just by leaning a little bit forward. He did more than that. Take a look at this little clip and you'll see what I mean. That's pressing on. That's saying, I'm going to finish this race. I'm going to win this race. I'm not going to lose this race. And that's the kind of passion and the kind of effort that I am challenging you to give in your life with Jesus Christ. I I'm challenging you this morning 
more than anything else in your life, to press on in your faith. Press on in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Pursue him with everything you've got, every ounce of energy and strength that you've got. Press on in raising a Christian family. No matter what else you give your kids and no matter what else you do for your kids, give them Jesus Christ because he's the one that will make the difference in their life. And press on in applying the teaching of Jesus to your life Monday through Saturday, not just on Sunday. Apply it every day. May becoming like Jesus be your greatest passion, your greatest desire in life. And press on in building irresistible bridges between Jesus Christ and the on church, Jesus Christ and those who are far from him. Press on, press on. Indeed, we are, we're living in a day and an hour when it will only be those who press on in their faith who will actually finish the race successfully. These are the days Jesus warned us about, evil days, days when it's becoming more and more difficult to live your life for Christ, more and more difficult to raise a Christian family, more and more difficult to be a Christian in the marketplace. These are the days when Jesus said that as Christians, and this is a quote, he said, you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world. Why? Because you are my followers. Not because something you said, not because something you did, not because of the color of your skin, but rather you will be hated because you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end the one who per presses on, I've written in there, will be saved. These are those days. These are the beginning of those days in Canada. I know in Canada, to a large degree, we are sheltered at this time from that persecution and being jailed and being hated. We're, we're sheltered from that to a large degree, although it's beginning to happen in this country. But I want you to know this morning that those days of being protected are very quickly coming to an end. A study was done in the UK of persecution around the world. And their results of that study were shocking. Here's what they discovered. They discovered the overwhelming majority, 80% of persecuted religious believers are Christians. 80, over 80% 80 of people who are persecuted are followers of Jesus Christ. The most hated the most persecuted people in the world today are people like you and me, people who follow Jesus Christ and claim to be a Christian, the most hated. You may not be aware of this, but in the United States of America today, in one of the largest political parties, there is a large section in that party that so hates Christians that they won't even speak the word Christian when referring to us. That's how much they hate us. I'm not trying to alarm you as I end, but rather I'm trying to prepare you that these are the days that are becoming more and more difficult to serve Jesus Christ because the teaching of Jesus, the morals of Jesus, the values of Jesus are offensive. They're offensive to the all-inclusive mindset of Canadians and people around the world today. What Jesus teaches is offensive today to people. And so it's going to require of us greater courage, greater determination than ever before to keep ourselves true to the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him. It's going to require on our part a fixed determination to press on. We're just going to have to decide in our hearts and in our spirit that no matter what happens, no matter how politically incorrect it might be, no matter the consequences, that we are going to press on for Jesus Christ and become all that he wants us to be. And I can tell you this, if we will do that, if we, you and I, will press on in the days that are ahead, we will finish the race victorious. We will be on top. I remember, it was, it's over 44 years ago now, my dad wrote me, well, he wrote me several letters when I was in college. But one of the letters he wrote me, 
He ended it with these powerful words that's taken from a great old hymn. You probably don't know it. I had to go back way back in my memory to remember it. But here's what he wrote to me. He said, not to the strong is the battle, not to the swift is the race, yet to the true and the faithful. Victory is promised through grace. That's amazing truth. I'm telling you, we are on the winning side, we who follow Jesus Christ. You know, we are going to win. We're going to come out on top. We are on the winning side. The best days of the bridge are in front of us and not behind us, I guarantee you. But in order to seize those wonderful days and those wonderful experiences in the Lord, we're going to have to press on in our faith like we've never done before. Press on in our faith, press on for Jesus, press on for the things that we know to be true and right. We're going to have to have a perseverance about our pressing on, about our faith, like we've never had before. We're going to have to just determine, doggedly determine, we're not giving up, we're not giving in, we're not going to surrender, we're going to persevere and press on. It was Calvin Coolidge who once said this, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Perseverance. Paul the Apostle understood that, and so he wrote, I press on. I press on. Martin Luther King Jr., he also understood this passage of Scripture. And in one of his speeches, he said this, If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Church, press on. Press on in your walk with Jesus Christ. Press on in raising your kids to love and serve Jesus Christ. Press on as never before. When it's hard, when it's difficult, when it's discouraging, when you can't figure out what God is doing, when you're disappointed, when you experience defeat, press on, press on. For the victory is in sight and God will bring us across that goal line successfully. I'm a great sports fan, as you know, and one of my favorite sports stories is a story about a man by the name of Derek Redman. Derek Redman is, uh, is a Breton, from Britain, and from England, and he is a racer, an Olympian for, uh, for England, and, and he became famous in the 1992 Barcelona uh, Olympics. Uh, he was running in the 400 meter race, and he was the favored to win. I mean, this guy had run all of his life, and he was known and recognized around the world as the best in the world. And so when he got to Barcelona, everyone knew when it came to the 400-meter race, Derek Redmond was going to win that race because he was just that good. He had trained. His body was in perfect condition. And so when he got into the starting, what I forget what you call those things you put your feet in. Ah, thank you, the starting blocks. When he got into the starting blocks, I was just thinking if you were listening. When he got into the starting blocks, you know, to race, he was ready to go. And when that gun sounded, he took off. And halfway through the race, Derek Redman was doing exactly what everybody knew he would do. He was in front. He was headed for a gold medal. When all of a sudden disaster struck, and he blew a hamstring, and he collapsed onto the track in absolute agony and pain. And as the other runners passed him, the medical people ran onto the track to help him, but he pushed them away and wouldn't allow them to help him. He said, I've come, I came to run this race, and I am going to finish the race that I started. And so slowly he got to his feet, and he started to hobble. He wasn't running. He was just hobbling down the track. You could see the agony and the tears running down his face as he ran. You can see the agony on his face as he was running forward. But he was determined he was not going to uh, end the race in a crumpled heap on, on the ground. And as he ran, hobbling or really just hobbling down the track, all of a sudden there was seen a man coming running out of the stands onto the track. The security people tried to stop him, but he would not be stopped. And he ran all the way up until he was right beside Derek Redman. It was Jim Redman, Derek's father. Jim Redman said to his dad, Dad, this is to his son, 
you don't have to do this, son. And Derek Redmond replied back to his dad, yes, I do. So the father said back to him, then we'll finish the race together. And that's what they did. Arm in arm, they ran towards, the, or not ran, but hobbled towards the finish line. And three yards before the finish line, Jim Redmond stepped back and let his son cross it all by himself. And the crowd was mesmerized. The crowd were on their feet. They were going crazy for Derek Redmond. They gave greater cheer and greater support to Derek than the man who actually won the gold medal. He had actually won because he pressed on. He didn't win the race that day, but he finished the race that day because he had determined in his heart that he didn't care what happened to him. He was going to press on, and he was going to cross that finish line. My friends that I love so much, that's my words to you. Press on. Press on in your faith with Jesus Christ. Press on as a Christian family. No matter what happens, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much pain you're in, press on. And know this, that if disaster should happen to you, you can be sure that out of the crowd, Jesus himself will come running to your side. He'll put his arm around you, and arm in arm, he'll help you to finish the race if you just press on. Press on. Press on. Because there's a battle to be won. There's a race to be finished. And there are more irresistible bridges to be built between Jesus Christ and those who are far from him. So press on. Press on. And it's that last point that brings me to this. Brings me to Pastor Scott and Lisa. They didn't know this was coming. But Scott and Lisa, I'm going to ask you to come and sit down here at the front. Because um, just, right, just right there. I can boss you still. Get down here. <laughs> and Judy, you can come and sit beside them. I want you to sit down front because I want to end my message by speaking specifically and directly to you. You can just, no, you can just sit down. Boy, that was fun. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> I want to talk to you too because you are, play a key role in helping these people that you and I love so much to push on and to press on to the finish. Scott, today is a very significant day for you and for me. For the last 15 years, I have tried to pastor this congregation the very best that I know how. I've given every ounce of strength and energy I have for them. I've done my best to be faithful, to preach the whole word of God, and to keep them focused on the mission that Jesus himself has given to us, to go and build irresistible bridges between himself and the people who are far from him, those who are unchurched, and those who are dechurched. The weight of responsibility that, that is on the shoulders of a pastor of a church this size is great. And for the past 15 years, I've carried that weight. But today, that weight is being transferred from my shoulders onto your shoulders. Nothing that you've done in ministry is anything like what you're about to do. Nothing, anything you've carried in, as far as responsibility is like the responsibility that you're going to carry. Because in just a few moments, the weight, the full weight of the responsibility that the Lord himself and these people have called you to carry is going to come and rest upon your shoulders. But before that happens, I, I'd like to share just a few words in front of them with you that I think are important. The first thing I want to share with you this morning is never, ever doubt that you can do this with the Lord's help. I know you already doubt, but I'm telling you, stop doubting. Never, ever, ever doubt that you can do this with the Lord's help because everything that has been in your life up to this point has prepared you for this moment through the Lord Jesus Christ. On your own, you will certainly fail, and you'll never be able to carry this responsibility or to lead these wonderful people. But with the Lord's help, and with the care and the prayers of Lisa and your family and your friends in this church, I'm telling you, you can do this. You are well able to do this because as Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. He can give you the strength that you need to carry that responsibility and to lead this congregation well. Of that, I have no doubt. Scott, it's your turn. 
It really is your turn. Paul, uh, Paul the Apostle, I, I love his teaching, and he writes to Timothy. And as I mentioned, Timothy is a, a younger pastor, and he's mentored Timothy. And he basically says to Timothy, Timothy, there, there comes a point in, in the in history of every person when, when you have to take the 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 response, spiritual leadership, the responsibility of spiritual leadership and the gospel of Jesus Christ and pass it from your generation on to the next generation, just like a, a racer in a relay race takes a baton and passes it on to the next person. In, in his own words, here's what he said. You, you have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. I really feel this morning like I, that I have the humble honor of passing on to you the spiritual baton of leadership for this church. Just as it was passed on to me from my dad, I have an opportunity to pass it on to you. And as I pass it on to you this morning, there's two things I want to share with you. There's actually lots of things I'd like to share. (laughs) But time only allows me to share two of them. And the first one is this, Scott. Guard your heart. No matter what else you do, guard your heart. It was Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, who first penned those words. He wrote this in the book of Proverbs, a book of wisdom. He said, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. I love how he worded it. Above all else, above everything else you could do, everything else you might think of doing, guard your heart. Because it's not your talent, it's not your wisdom, it's not your skills, it's not your creativity that will set the course of your life and the course of this church. It will be your heart. Because it's from your heart that everything flows. So do everything in your power to keep your heart pure. And keep it pliable in the Lord's hands. Keep it filled with love for him and love for people. Carve out time every single day of your life to be alone with Jesus, just you and him, not in ministry, just you and him, so that he might work on your heart. He might shape it and develop it and build it and feed it. The temptation for you, as it is for all of us, but especially you in leadership, the temptation is the exact opposite. The temptation for you will be to, to, try, to allow other things, the other responsibilities, the other important crises that come across your desk to crowd that time out of your schedule but don't do it. Fight that temptation with everything that you've got for the health of your life, your marriage, your family, this church, and the on-church depends upon you having a pure heart that is pliable in the Lord's hands. So guard your heart against jealousy and envy and pride and greed and selfishness and the desire for power. Keep your heart pliable in the Lord's hands. Let him shape and mold it every single day. And secondly, you have shared with me, as you've shared with all of us in this church many times, that you grew up without a dad. And that when you married Lisa, I not only became a kind of a father-in-law to you, I became a dad to you. Well, this morning, as I pass this baton on to you, As your dad, I want to share with you what my dad shared with me when he preached my ordination service. It's words that are taken from Paul's letter to Timothy once again. And it's a challenge that he gave to Timothy. It's a challenge my dad gave to me, and it's a challenge I give to you this morning. And it's a challenge to preach the word of God. To preach the word of God. You know, there is nothing more powerful than the word of God. It won't be, it won't be really, it won't be your, your wisdom, it won't be your skills, it won't be your talent that will mend a broken heart, that will heal a broken marriage, or that will lift a down spirit. It, it won't be your skills or your creativity or even your ability to speak well publicly and one-on-one 
There will actually bring hope to the hopeless and joy to the joyless, love to the loveless and peace to the peaceless. But rather, it will only be the word of God. There is nothing in all the world and nothing that you have that is more powerful than the word of God. The writer to the Hebrews put it this way. He said, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our inmost thoughts and our desires. And so Paul, I say to you, preach the word of God. Preach the word of God. Nothing you have will bring hope or peace and joy to the people that you lead, but the word of God. And so I want to read to you And I want to read it right out of the Bible, just as my father read to me. So I'm reading to you. He read this from 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 2. And he said to him, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase their myths. But you, Scott, you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given to you. Preach the word of God. Guard your heart and preach the word. Guard your heart and preach the word. If you will do those two things as you take this baton, God will bless you and bless your marriage and bless your family, and he'll bless us as a people as we follow under your leadership. If you'll just guard your heart and preach the word of God. So I'm going to ask Scott and Lisa and Judy if you'd come up here for just a moment. Would you come up? Scott, I want to pass this baton on to you symbolically. But it's a special baton that was made just for you, handmade by one of our own craftsmen. On one side of it, it says, preach the word, 2 Timothy 4.2. And on the other side, it says, Reverend Scott Landry, June 30th, 2019. Scott, it is an honor for me to pass this baton to you. As my father passed it to me, that you as now the, take leadership of the bridge and lead these people. And I... And Scott, I present you this word of God. It has a special inscription in it. I didn't do the writing so you could read it. I got Judy to write it for me. But it has a very special inscription in it. It says, present it to Scott Myers Landry. By your father and grandfather Summers, on the occasion of becoming lead pastor of the bridge. Love you, brother. I just want to pray for them. Would you, would you join me in praying? And then I'm going to turn the rest over to him. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this church, for these people. They are the best of the best, and we love them so much, both Scott and I and Judy and Lisa. We love them with all of our hearts, and we are so honored and so privileged to be able to lead them. And so, Father, today, I, I, as I pass this baton of leadership on to Scott, I pass it with great confidence, knowing that you have prepared him and you have called him and you have confirmed that call by, through these people to lead this church. And I just pray, Father, that you will fill him with your Holy Spirit, 
that you will give him great power and great joy and, and, and the wonderful sense of your anointing upon his life each day. As he leads these people, we pray, Father, that he would lead under your anointing. We pray in the times that are difficult that your spirit will come upon him and encourage him and build him up. I pray, Father, that you will help him as he guards his heart and keeps it pure and keeps it only for you, that you will strengthen it and feed it and grow it. And Father, as he preaches the word, may it come forth with great power. You have gifted him, and we pray that his gifts would be sharpened and increased, but we pray more than anything, Father, that as he preaches the word, your power would come upon him. And be with Lisa as, as she stands with him. Help her, Lord, to be a great encouragement and strength to him each day. And as she shares in her own ministry in the church, we pray, Lord, that you would build her up and strengthen her. So be with them as, the, as our pastoral family. May you strengthen and fill them with joy, and may they see great results and many coming to know you as Lord and Savior because of the leadership they give to this church. For we pray these things in your powerful name. Amen. Friends that I love so much, I present to you our new lead pastor. Now, one last thing I want to say just before I turn it over to him. Um, I get to stay on and work with him. I'm going to help him a little bit. I'm going to go away for the summer so that he can just get him by himself for a little while. And so you won't see me until September except for a kids camp. I can't miss kids camp. Uh, that's one condition always in there. Um, but when I come back, I'm going to be following him. He's not only your pastor, he's my pastor. He's my spiritual leader now. And you know, uh, everybody's a little bit different. And although our vision is the same, our desires are the same, we have difference. He wears skinny jeans. <laughs> I obviously don't. I'm doing my best to join him in being bald, but I'm not there yet. But everybody does something different. And so somewhere along the line, you know, he's going to do something new and different than what I do. And somebody, some of you are going to come up to me and you're going to say, hey, what do you think about that thing that Scott's doing? Well, I just want to save you the trouble of trying to find me and ask me that question because I can tell you what my answer is going to be right now. My answer is going to be, I think it's marvelous. I think it's wonderful. I'm 100% behind him. doesn't matter what the question is. That's always going to be my answer. So, you know, I, I'm just wholly behind him. I believe that a church needs to support him, and I, I believe that former pastors need to support the pastors. And I, I'm behind him 100%. I turn it over to you. Yeah, no, I'm not. No, uh, you've given me plenty. No, I don't want the hanky either. Um, so I haven't had coffee today, and I wasn't. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter where you've been no matter what you've been through. Your Father in heaven is faithful, and he is good. And there is nothing that you could do that could derail the plans that he has for your life. And if you don't believe that about you, hopefully what you've seen this morning maybe will encourage you just a little bit. Because there was a time in my life where <laughs> a day like this was not even a dream, and it was more than a miracle. But because of our Heavenly Father, it's a reality today. And I give him praise and thanks and glory. I am so thankful to be a part of a church that understands grace and mercy and redemption and reconciliation. And that they're more than words. They're more than words. They can be the definition of a community. And to be a part of that with you and to be given this opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants. Mervyn Summers is a man I only got to meet at the end of his journey, but the legacy that he left, I'm in awe of. Quite frankly, 
feel inadequate to, to reproduce and to see that lived out in his son. <laughs> it's a truly an honor to have a front row seat. It really is. Uh, this morning is not certainly not about me, and I don't want to make it any more about that. It's an honor to be with you this morning and to celebrate Reverend Stanley Allen Summers and Judy Summers, two amazing people. Again, it's one of those things, the old saying goes, you don't know what you got till it's gone. <laughs> and that's so true. I tried to ask Alan to give me a pair of his shoes because I want to put them on my bookcase to always be reminded that they're big shoes to fill. They may not be shoes I'd wear, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, they're ones I want to be worthy of wearing, that's for sure. That's for sure. I'm going to invite uh, Matt Bound, who is the vice chair of our advisory team, as well as all the members that are present this morning of the advisory team to join me on stage. And uh, we have, uh, I'm just going to turn this off here, maybe, yeah. Um, Corey, I'll take your hand too. <laughs> and I'm going to invite Matt to come on up front. So I got the privilege of saying thank you on behalf of the congregation. I'm Matt Bound. I'm the vice chair of the advisory team I'm elected by you guys and to serve on behalf of you in the congregation as we make all kinds of church decisions and business and whatnot. And today we'd just like to um, speak a little bit to a token of gratification of of trying to, in meager ways, show how great and what a legend you've been here for us, the congregation, and for myself here at the bridge. You've had such a complex relationship with so many of us, ranging from literal father to figurative father to, um, to confidant to pastor to you name it, you've had that role, and we've been just so blessed and amazed to see it. I can tell you all that at my best moment, that man was there when I was getting baptized. I can tell you at my lowest moment, I called three people. I called God, my dad, and that man. And I just think we are so blessed and so lucky to have 15 amazing years of your time and your service. So, Mackenzie, if you can throw up on the screen. Why don't we actually have Alan come back yeah, up? That's a great idea. Let's just throw him under the bus. Yeah. So on behalf of the congregation, we've thrown together a few pennies, and um, if Mackenzie, you can put it on the screen, we've um, gotten a picture or painting commissioned on behalf of you and your time, and by the artist Mitchell Webster. So you will get to see that in a couple of months, Scott. It is. It's a picture of his uh, favorite place. Your favorite place. Oh, is that right? And on behalf of the, the entire church, um, I'm sure everyone wants to, but I just want to tell you that we love you. You are a legend, and thank you for everything you've done for this church. Because as one of our favorite pastors, Andy Stanley, would say, it's not by what you do that you're going to be remembered, but it's how you loved. And you loved each and every one of us with every ounce of your time, your energy, and your body. So just thank you, Alan, on behalf of all of us. Thank you. One of the, uh, thanks Matt, so the, the, just to, the painting is, uh, you, sorry, you, you're going to be up and down a few more times, so just, it's good, right? <laughs> but um, one of the, the, uh, the, the painting has actually uh, been commissioned uh, of his, the family cottage, um, and uh, it's, it's, some, it's his favorite place in the world, so uh, we hope that every time you see that painting, you remember I sure every will. day here as well, because I know when you're here, you're thinking of being there, so... <laughs> I, I, I wish that we had statistics to know how many people you've married, 
how many funerals you've commissioned, how many babies you've dedicated, how many people you've prayed with to receive Christ. We know how many sermons you've preached, and they've all been amazing. Um, But what we don't know and what we don't see is how many prayers you've prayed and how many tears you've shed for people that you've loved and still love. And it's been an honor to see that from a distance. And, and I honestly had no idea that you were going to give me a gift this morning. Um, still a little shocked by that. But uh, the, the painting is one thing. We wanted to get you uh, something else. And um, we, we did. Uh, the congregation, you know, gave money to, to, some, to some gifts for you. And that the painting was, is, is you're going to love it. It's going to be wonderful. I was going to do it myself. But uh, <laughs> they didn't have a paint by number of the cottage, so I couldn't get, get one of those. But... Uh, so anyways, um, we, so we know that we've got your favorite food, we've got your favorite drink, we've got a painting of your favorite place, and there's really, I mean, only, well, there's a couple more things we could have done, but there's only one other thing that we could do, and that's to, uh, to give you your favorite car. So, now we didn't buy one, just, <laughs> but out in that parking lot for the few first, at least, week of your retirement, this baby's yours. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So. And, and the rest of the money that you gave is for the speeding tickets that we know are going to come along with, with it. <laughs> so I just have one more thing to share, and then one we're... More. One more thing. I actually had my Bible down there, and it was given to me by some man I didn't even know when I was ordained. And so it's going to collect dust because this one just smells good. (laughs) In the book of Acts chapter 20, Alan has quoted uh, Paul a number of times. Paul is is basically the godfather of the church. We're here today because of the ministry that Paul had. He took the gospel to the known world and created churches and led churches, and there were many churches that that he kind of ministered to and pastors that he trained and equipped. And there came a a, a point in Paul's journey um, where he was coming to an end. Uh, His journey was almost finished, his his race, his ministry. And um, in the book of Acts, which is the book in the New Testament that, that chronicles the life of the early church, It says this, and I I just want to take a few moments to read this to you and see who it makes you think of. Paul went by land to Assos where he had arranged for us to join him while while we traveled by ship. He joined us there and we sailed together to Matilne. The next day we sailed past the islands of Chios. The following day we crossed the islands of Samos and a day later we arrived at Miletus. Basically they were traveling. Paul had decided to sail on past Ephesus, for he didn't want to spend any more time in the province of Asia. He was hurrying to get to Jerusalem, if possible, in time for the festival of Pentecost. But when we landed at Miletus, he sent a message to the elders of the church at Ephesus, which is a church that he ministered, asking them to come to meet him. When they arrived, he declared, You know that from the day I set foot in the province of Asia until now, I have done the Lord's work humbly and with many tears." I have endured the trials that come to me from the plots of the Jews. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear. I preached the word, either publicly or in your homes. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and of having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now I am bound by the Spirit to go to Jerusalem. I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But my life is worth nothing. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned by me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And now I know that none of you whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. I declare today that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, it's not my fault, for I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Sound like anything we've heard for the last two weeks or the last 15 years? So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has anointed you as leaders. 
I know that fal false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out. Remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch and care over you night and day and my many tears for you. And now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those that he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Again, I ask you, does that sound like anyone we're fortunate enough to know? I think so. The interesting thing about this passage of Scripture is Paul was saying goodbye, and he was certain he would never see these people again. And although this passage is very similar to our experience this morning, I'm thankful that that is the one difference we're not saying goodbye. I'm so thankful that Alan and Judy are still a part of this church, that Alan, you're still in a, on part of this staff, but you're part of this community. And I believe you have so much more to give, to teach, and to share. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad, most of all, because he said that they would never see him again, and then they escorted him down to the ship. And again, I say, I'm so thankful that that's where the difference of the story is. That Tuesday, we're back to work. <laughs> and it is an honor to con continue to serve with you. And I know I still have so much, so much to learn. And I'm so thankful that you're the one that can teach me. We're going to invite you to stand uh, this morning as we close. And the interesting thing, yeah, he wants out of here, but the interesting thing, you may have to send him an email. Um, the interesting thing in that passage was that in typical fashion, we would pray for Alan, but Paul went out praying for them. And so Alan, pastor, friend, father. Would you pray for us? Before I pray, just let me let me say thank you. I, I don't know how, I don't know how to say thank you. I, I, I'm, <laughs> Judy, you're not going to see me for the next week. <laughs> just send my meals to the car. <laughs> I'm not sleeping or eating. I'm just staying in that car. Thank you so much. What, I, I don't know what to say. I th thank you so much. I don't even, Thank you so much. It's been such a privilege to be your pastor. I am so honored. If y'all want to ride, come on and see me. I'll take anywhere, anyone, anytime, anyplace. But thank you so much. You mean so much to Judy and I, and we love you so much. Thank you for this. I'll enjoy this week like you have no idea. And I'll enjoy, and I'll enjoy that picture of the cottage. I love the cottage so much. So thank you so much. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for these people. They're not just people. They're my family, and I thank you for what a, what a wonderful family they are. Thank you for the joy they brought to Judy and I and my family. Thank you for the love they've given to us. Thank you for the way they've stood with us and prayed for us and encouraged us and worked with us. Thank you for the things that you've done in their lives and through them that have touched so many people. And now, Father, as I surrender the leadership to Scott, I just pray that your blessing would come upon them in a wonderful way. May they be filled with your joy and your peace. May they be strengthened to press on every single day. And Father, there'll be those days when the enemy attacks and there'll be those days when it will seem like you are far from them, when in reality you're so close to them. And in those days, we pray especially that your spirit will come upon them and empower them and strengthen them. Father, may they have such perseverance in their faith that they will go from victory unto victory unto victory because you are the one who leads them and guides them and empowers them. Father, bless their homes, their families, and all that they do, and bless this church. 
May we see more and more bridges built, that more and more people might come to know you in a personal way. So, Father, I commit my family to you and lead them in your care under Scott's leadership as you look after them through him. For I pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much. One more time. Man. Blew me away. <laughs>